continue on through uh, 1 Samuel, and uh, we pick up where we left off last week in the middle of uh, chapter 14, and uh, Saul is uh, king of Israel, and they're battling the Philistines who have encamped right in the center of the promised land. 1 Samuel chapter 14, beginning in verse 24, this is God's word, eternally true. Now the men of Israel were in distress that day because Saul had bound the people under an oath saying, cursed be any man who eats food before evening comes before I have avenged myself on my enemies. So none of the troops tasted food. The entire army entered the woods and there was honey on the ground. When they went into the woods, they saw the honey oozing out. Yet no one put his hand to his mouth because they feared the oath. But Jonathan had not heard that his father had bound the people with the oath. So he reached out the end of his staff that was in his hand and dipped it into the honeycomb. He raised his hand to his mouth and his eyes brightened. Then one of the soldiers told him, Your father bound the army under a strict oath, saying, Cursed be any man who eats food today. That is why the men are faint. Jonathan said, my father has made trouble for the country. See how my eyes brightened when I tasted a little of this honey. How much better it would have been if the men had eaten today some of the plunder they took from their enemies. Would not the slaughter of the Philistines have been even greater? That day after the Israelites had struck down the Philistines from Michmash to Ajalon, they were exhausted. They pounced on the plunder and Taking sheep, cattle, and calves, they butchered them on the ground and ate them together with the blood. Then someone said to Saul, Look, the men are sinning against the Lord by eating meat that has blood in it. You have broken faith, he said. Roll a large stone over here at once. Then he said, Go out among the men and tell them, Each of you bring me your cattle and sheep and slaughter them here and eat them. Do not sin against the Lord by eating meat with blood still in it. So everyone brought his ox that night and slaughtered it there. Then Saul built an altar to the Lord. It was the first time he had done this. Saul said, Let us go down after the Philistines by night and plunder them till dawn, and let us not leave one of them alive. Do whatever seems best to you, they replied. But the priest said, Let us inquire of God here. So Saul asked God, Shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you give them into Israel's hand? But God did not answer him that day. Saul therefore said, Come here, all, who, all you who are leaders, all you who are leaders of the army, and let us find out what sin has been committed today. As surely as the Lord who rescues Israel lives, even if it lies with my son Jonathan, he must die. But not one of the men said a word. Saul then said to all the Israelites, You stand over there, I and Jonathan, my son, will stand over here. Do what seems best to you, the men replied. Then Saul prayed to the Lord, the God of Israel, Give me the right answer. And Jonathan and Saul were taken by lot, and the men were cleared. Saul said, Cast the lot between me and Jonathan, my son. And Jonathan was taken. Then Saul said to Jonathan, Tell me what you've done. So Jonathan told him, I merely tasted a little honey with the end of my staff, and now I must die? Saul said, May God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if you do not die, Jonathan. But the men said to Saul, Should Jonathan die, he who has brought about this great deliverance in Israel? Never. As surely as the Lord lives, not a hair of his head will fall to the ground, for he did this today with God's help. So the men rescued Jonathan, and he was not put to death. Then Saul stopped pursuing the Philistines, and they withdrew to their own land. After Saul had assumed rule over Israel, he fought against their enemies on every side. Moab, the Ammonites, Edom, the kings of Zobah, and the Philistines. 
Wherever he turned, he inflicted punishment on them. He fought valiantly and defeated the Amalekites, delivering Israel from the hands of those who had plundered them. Saul's sons were Jonathan, Ishvi, and Malkishua. The name of his older daughter was Merab, and that of his younger was Michael. His wife's name was Ahinoam, daughter of Ahimeaz. The name of the commander of Saul's army was Abner, son of Ner, and Ner was Saul's uncle. Saul's father Kish and Abner's father Ner were sons of Abiel. All the days of Saul, there was bitter war with the Philistines. And whenever Saul saw a mighty or brave man, he took him into his service. Here ends our reading. We have a response of thankfulness that's printed for us uh, there in our bulletins. The word of the Lord. Thanks indeed. Let's pray. I've um, recently met with uh, two people who have been friends of mine for a long time who uh, have uh, been in the church. Um, and uh, uh, things have uh, not been going well uh, for them. Um, and these were uh, two different individuals who uh, uh, came to a point in their lives where they said, though they were in the church and and uh, uh, seemed to be believers that, that they, they wondered about the, the, the value of, of Jesus and his guidance upon them through his word in their lives. Is it valuable to me, the question was, to follow Jesus in my life, in the things that I'm doing, in, in the way that I'm, that I'm doing these things? And, and uh, unfortunately, for lack of a better word, um, at, at one point, they came to say, well, no, it doesn't really matter. As in, in, my, in my life, it doesn't matter that I follow Jesus or not. And, 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 and so uh, it, it was tough. it's been tough over the, the last number of years uh, for them and, uh, and for me as their friend and, and as I met with them recently uh, about this. Um, for one of them, it led to significant uh, chaos uh, in his life, uh, in, in his family, with uh, things going through a, a divorce and his family being uh, split apart. Uh, for another, uh, nothing, nothing yet. And um, ho hopefully there'll be a change in things before something comes along. But as we look at this text here, uh, what we see from the Lord is a, a, a pleading of God uh, with us to see the value it is for us as people who bear his name, Christians, to walk in the ways of Jesus, our leader, our king, to see Jesus as uh, certainly more than just a ticket to eternal life. And certainly through faith in Jesus, we have eternal life. And, and as Jesus said, he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through him. And that's readily seen by Christians, but, but sometimes what's not seen, and sometimes even in us, we don't see the value of, of seeking him out through his word and walking in his ways. If you'd like to fill out blanks in an outline, you're welcome to do that, if that helps you uh, track along. If you want to just listen, uh, that's okay too, but if you're uh, a, a blank filler in her, that's a real term. Uh, if you're a blank filler in her, here we go. Our introduction here. Non-believers and even, and even you, every Christian, uh, non-believers and even every Christian um, can believe that we don't need Jesus in our lives. And sometimes presented with this, we may say, oh, no, of course I believe I need Jesus in my life. But if we would examine our lives, we'd see maybe a number of areas where we say, you know what, I haven't, I haven't valued him and how I do this thing that I have before me or that thing or how I'm carrying on this relationship. And so this passage is about this, of valuing Jesus and the way he would have us live each part, each part of our life. Um, so non-believers and, and you can sometimes see that we don't need Jesus in life and that's a mistake for us. But this life 
without Jesus, this passage teaches us, and this is your next line, without Jesus' leadership force will be for anybody a life lived foolishly. That is, if we live without the leadership of Jesus, without him as our king guiding us, uh, it'll be a life lived foolishly and with much distress. That's what this passage teaches us, that there's foolishness in not walking in Jesus' ways, and that that foolishly lived life leads us in, in, into distress uh, and, and sometimes ex exhaustion even. And we see that in verses 24 and 29 here. How are the people under Saul? Uh, as we've been talking about, Saul is not, uh, he, he's not a great king. He's kind of the anti-example of what a, a person uh, is to be as king. And so the people under Saul, verse 24, they're in, they're in distress. And then we can look in, in verse 29 there, and we see that even Jonathan, his son, who we find out Jonathan is a dutiful son, uh, but, but even he has to declare, my father has just brought trouble on us. My father's a, a leader who makes foolish decisions for us, and he brings trouble. And that's the message for us, that, that leaders apart from Jesus bring us trouble and bring us distress in our lives. So, number one, we're to see this. As the people rejected Saul here, as the people rejected Saul here, so you should reject other leaders for your soul accepting Jesus. The only leader for your soul should be Jesus. And we see here that the, the, the people that reject, we reject Saul. Do you see what goes on here? It's an interesting point. Saul calls this oath upon himself, and, and he says, you know, may it be done to me and ever so severely if the one who's done this thing, even if it's my son Jonathan, doesn't die today. And so Saul calls a curse from the Lord down upon himself if he doesn't put Jonathan, his son, to death. And then the people say, don't put Jonathan to death. Do you see the implication of that? One, they're saving Jonathan. But two, they're saying, we don't care if curses come down upon you, Saul. You've called down a curse upon yourself if Jonathan doesn't die. And we're telling you, Jonathan should not die. Do not kill him. You should be cursed, Saul. See the, the logic of that? And this is a message for us. If there's a king who's not a, a David or a son of David, and our son of David is Jesus, we should reject him or reject it. If it's a philosophy of some kind, or reject her, whatever it is, if it's trying to lead our soul in some way, we should reject that. So as the people rejected Saul, so you and I should reject other leaders for our soul except Jesus. So A, therefore, is just kind of review, but also emphasized here in this text, Saul was not God's choice as king for, for his people. Saul was not God's choice for his people's king. So we see this in chapter 12, verse 13. Uh, God has given Saul to them as a king because they wanted a king like the nations. So he gave them a king like the nations, a king who would act like the kings of the nations acted, a king who would extract from them not sacrificially serve them. And so he gave them a king, Saul, who would extract from them. And, and so he does that. We see that in verse 52. Whenever he sees someone useful for him to fight for him, he grabs them and he impresses them to his, his military service. Uh, and so uh, chapter 12, verse 13 there, he says, Saul's the king of your choice. That's what he says there. Um, B, uh, Jesus, the son of David, is God's choice to lead you. Yeah, he's God's choice to lead you. And, and we see this in Matthew 17, 5. Bob read that for us. Uh, Jesus is there on, on the mountain, and he's transfigured, as we put it. And, and God speaks from heaven and says, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. God has appointed God the Father has appointed Jesus for us to listen to. He loves him. 
Uh, he's his son, and uh, in the Old Testament, God's son, small s, not divine, was the king God had chosen for his people. We see that in 2 Samuel 7 and, and 1 Chronicles 17 in the Davidic covenant, that the king over God's people, David and his sons, would be sons of God, lower s, not divine, but special in their status, a special child of God. So Jesus, son of David, is God's choice to lead us. And so Jesus descends from David. He's called the son of David in the Gospels, and he's God's choice to lead us. B, Jesus calls you and I to follow him, to follow him and not others in your thoughts and in your words and in your deeds. And we saw in that Matthew 8 passage, even your own earthly father, if Following Jesus and following your earthly father are at odds, you follow Jesus. Okay? Um, this doesn't mean you dishonor your father. You need to honor your father. But if you're an adult, if you're out of your father's home, okay, and your father and what, what he says and what God wants you to do as communicated through scripture, if they are different, you follow Jesus. This man comes to Jesus and says, I'll follow you wherever you go. But first, let me follow my father. And Jesus says, no. Uh -uh. If you're going to follow me, you need to follow me. And so this is a message for us. We follow Jesus over all else, even over our, our father or over some influential figure in our lives when it comes to what our souls are doing and thinking and, and believing. So we can put this in marriage terms, you know, that Christ is the head of the church, but he's also the husband of the church, and the church is his bride. And so when we say yes to Jesus, when we believe in him, when we're on the altar, giving our vow to him, first believing in him, we forsake all others, like we say in our marriage vows. And that's what Jesus says. He says, you know, he who loves his father and mother more than me, he loves his land or possessions more than me, is not worthy of me, and not worthy to be called my disciple. Okay. Number two. Number two. So first of all, we reject all other leaders besides Jesus who are attempting to lead our souls. Okay, so do what your boss says, and you know, do what your teacher says, do what your coach says. But in terms of soul leadership, follow Jesus and follow those who are communicating his word. So if I communicate his word to you, a fellow believer communicates his word to you, uh, one of the elders of the church communicates his word to you, that's Jesus leading you through that person. Okay? But be like a Berean, like an Acts, and make sure that what they're leading you in is in accordance with Scripture and not against it. Okay, number two. You know, why? Why would we want to follow Jesus? And it has to do with the consequences of not. The consequences of not following Jesus, which we see here, the consequences of following Saul, following a king of our own choosing. What happens when we see a bunch of bad things here in this passage? So number two, the consequences of not following Jesus are various forms of distress and unnecessary trouble. So we bring upon ourselves distress and unnecessary trouble when we follow in our souls other people, things, philosophy than Jesus. Just like Saul brought distress on the people. Um, and we say unnecessary trouble because uh, Jesus said to us in, in John 16, 33, in the world you will have troubles, but take courage, I've overcome the world. So we'll have troubles for being a believer. As we desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy, or, yeah, 2 Timothy 3, 12, we will be persecuted. So we'll have troubles, but we don't want to bring unnecessary trouble on our lives by failing to follow the right king, Jesus. So A, so A. Others leading you won't give you lasting deliverance from your distresses. Um, so, you know, I, I was watching recently uh, a, a doc, it was a docudrama. Yeah, I think that's right. So it was half acted and half documentary on Jim Jones. Um, some of you are old enough to remember Jim Jones, and in the fall of 1978, in November, we had on uh, Time Magazine on the front cover and on all the news channels that uh, uh, about 900 people had 
committed suicide or been forced to commit suicide or had been injected with uh, poison Kool-Aid. So if, you know, if you're younger and you know the expression, drink the Kool-Aid, it's from November of 1978 with Jim Jones. He took a cult from San Francisco and uh, uh, surprisingly, it very, it very much wasn't very much about Jesus. Um, a lot of times cults have a lot of connection with Jesus. This really didn't. Um, but he, he took them and they moved down to Guyana in South America. And, uh, and they established a Jonestown, named it after himself. That's a big red flag, OK? <laughs> and and they, were, they were five miles from all civilization. In the middle of trees, dirt road, they, you know, no one could really escape from there. They had guards, all that kind of thing. But people followed Jim Jones because he promised to relieve them of their distress in life. And he was popular in his message in the mid-70s because of the discord with Vietnam, racial discord, riots had been, had been occurring in cities from 1968 on, on forward. And a lot of people came because they saw chaos in the world and he promised uh, to them relief from their distress. But he didn't provide for them relief from their distress, not only in the fact that their lives ended in uh, this, this mass suicide or forced suicide, but also when a, a team of people went down there with a, a congressman from San Francisco and some media and that kind of thing, um, numbers of people secretly came up to them and said, I need to get out. Can you get me out of here? Um, they had found that, that uh, their distress was not relieved by following Jim Jones. Uh, and, and there are different things for us in our, in our lives, too. Uh, more commonly, we're, we're a little less susceptible to following a Jim Jones type, although this happens. David Koresh was very much like this as well. But, but we get messages more like, wealth will lead you away from your distress. If I just have enough money, then distress will leave me. I won't have to worry about bills and that kind of thing. But then we can look at history and see, you know, guys like Howard Hughes and very wealthy people haven't been very happy people and haven't had very happy children and happy family lives. And it's just as Paul said in 1 Timothy 6, uh, wealth doesn't relieve you from trouble. It brings a whole host of trouble to you that you otherwise wouldn't have had. Okay. So others leading you won't give you lasting deliverance from your distresses. So the people cried out and they said, we want a king like the nations, but this king like the nations, this king that wasn't God's choice, brought them distress. Verse 24. And then verse 52, right after a number of verses there, look at the end of this passage, right after a number of verses where we think, hey, but Saul did okay. You know, he went out and he inflicted punishment on all these other nations. But you see the summary of God, the Holy Spirit, writing this verse 32 of Saul. The people have distress all through Saul's kingship because of the Philistines. There's no definitive victory. It's this aching, ongoing, you know, Vietnam, okay? This wearying war that keeps happening. And there's no deliverance from these people. It's just war, 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 war under Saul. Wrong king, and so no deliverance from their, from their distress. On the other hand, uh, next line for you there under your A. Jesus gives peace. Jesus gives, when you have the right king, that brings peace to you. We'll see this when we get to David. He brings peace to God's people. But, but we see this with, with Jesus as well. Galatians 5, 22, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. Okay, and we can think about peace in terms of this Old Testament idea. Do you have invaders in the promised land causing you oppression and hardship? causing you to have to be in battle instead of just at home, farming, and enjoying the crops. Okay, or, or John uh, 14, 27 and, and 16, 33, like I mentioned to you before. In the world you'll have troubles, but take courage. I have given you peace in the midst of this trouble in the world. Okay, and, and, and David, when he would come as king, he wouldn't conquer the whole world, but God's people would have peace 
under him. There would be peace in the promised land, tranquility. They wouldn't be fearing from foreign invaders coming in and burning down their, their houses. Jesus said in John 14, 27, Peace I live, leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. B. Others leading you. So Jesus gives you peace. Others leading you uh, will contribute to your exhaust, exhaustion. Okay? And, and we see this in chapter 28 through 31. When Saul is leading the people, it leads them to exhaustion. Okay, he binds them to this oath, and this oath probably happens before, you probably have a before and after the battle right here in the front of this passage. That he binds the people to an oath before the battle, and then when they're going through the trees, it's after the battle. Okay, the first part of the passage, probably why Jonathan is not there, is because Jonathan has already gone, as we saw in the beginning of chapter 14, and he and his armor bearer have already been fighting the battle. And then they're, they're there and right before our passage here today, Saul gathers the troops. And it's probably then that he, he gathers them under this oath. Um, and, and so Jonathan hasn't heard this oath, but the people are exhausted and they're worn out. And, and they're, they're playing a game without sleep for the two nights before. You know, it's kind of hard. Not much energy, and they're exhausted in this. And, and Jonathan underlines this. It's Saul uh, forbidding people on oath to eat anything has made them exhausted. And Jonathan says, man, the, he doesn't say man, that's me. <laughs> he says, wouldn't the battle have been much better? Wouldn't the victory have been much better had my father let us eat? See my eyes? I ate this little bit of honey. My eyes brightened. I feel strength. And it's like my mom used to say, my family knows this, when I'd feel not great physically, she'd say, or sometimes even emotionally, well, eat a little bit, John, you'll feel better. And we know that even physically, you know, some, something, you know, in our blood sugar, you know, just, just helps, helps lift us. Um, so others leading you will contribute to your exhaustion. And you see that word here, here in this text, the people, the people were exhausted. Uh, they were faint. See that word there. Jesus, though, in contrast to this, following him, what's his promise? And we saw his promise there in our declaration of the gospel. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden in your lives, and I will give you rest. He gives us rest for our souls, and we can see how this ties into us having peace. He gives us rest, Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29. And number two there, he will, so to speak, brighten your eyes. He will brighten your eyes by feeding, by feeding your soul. How do you have strength for life? Well, he feeds your soul and, and he quenches your spiritual thirst with himself bread of God. I am the bread of life, he says. He who eats of me will never hunger. Okay, contrast this to what, what the wrong king does. With the wrong king, you have nothing to eat and you're exhausted in life. But Jesus instead is the bread of life and he, he feeds us so we never hunger and he feeds us by his word. He says, uh, so he feeds our souls. He quenches our spiritual thirst with himself, his spirit, and his word. That's your third, third uh, line there for us. And we saw in Isaiah 40, verses 28 through 31, which are, are our call to worship. And you can look there at the front page there. Um, what's the Lord's result for us as we, as we, live, as we live our lives? Sorry, that's not, I, put the, I put that in our Old Testament readings. The result is that the weary will have their strength renewed and will rise up uh, with wings like eagles. We will run and not be weary. We will walk and not faint. You know, and these words are listed specifically here in 1 Samuel, being weary and faint, and that's what people are, and that's what we are 
apart from following Jesus and walking in his ways under his leadership. We grow, we grow weary and we faint. We're, we're exhausted. Jesus in John 6, 35 said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. In John 7, Jesus said in verse 37, on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this, he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. So Jesus feeds us by his word, the Bible. He strengthens us, our weary souls, by his spirit who dwells in us. And this makes us strong in life. This brightens our eyes like Jonathan's eyes were brightened. And then see, and then see another consequence of following others besides Jesus is this. Others leading you will bring you failure and limited success in the two front war of the Christian life. So we've talked about in the last number of weeks in, in 1 Peter 2, verse 11, that the Christian life is war and that, that temptations come and they, they wage war. Sin comes and it wages war against our souls. And that's part of the, 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 the war that we're in, Tem war against temptation, waging war against our souls, but also the war that we're in for the souls of the people who are around us who don't yet know Christ. And we're in this battle and Paul talks about this is war for us, and he speaks of that in Ephesians 6 from verses 17 through 20. And he speaks of that in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5, that his preaching the gospel, our teaching others of Jesus and his forgiveness of sins is waging war in the world so that they might bow the knee to our king, so that they might have Jesus as their king and have, might have his protection as they go into as they go into death. So others will lead you and bring you uh, failure and limited success in the two-front war. Uh, Saul's leadership, the leadership of a king God had not chosen, brought them limited victory. And this is what Jonathan underlines. Wouldn't the battle have been much, wouldn't the victory have been much greater? Um, and Saul brings failure to them and, and, and even extended throughout Saul's reign, there's this extended failure. They can never rid themselves of the, the Philistines like this. And as long as Saul ruled, there was, how's it put it in verse 52? Bitter war with the Philistines. So the, your little number one there, others leading you uh, will lead you un, in Un, into unnecessary failure in your war against temptation, uh, bringing you to sin and to disregard God's commands. And we see this happens under Saul um, because of the foolish way he's led, keeping people from eating anything. People are so hungry that when they have the, uh, uh, the, the cattle and the, the animals of the Philistines before them, they slaughter these animals and they can't wait for the, the food to be cooked and they, they eat it when the blood was still in it. And that was a no-no a if you were an Old Testament Israelite to eat meat with blood still in it. It needed to be cooked full, full through. And so the people have sinned and that's noted here. And so Saul's foolish leadership has led the people you know, into this sinful uh, uh, state where they, they sin against the Lord and they disregard God's law. And that's what leadership can do. That can, what leadership can do uh, for us. Um, and I think about this in my own life. What, what does that for me? And I think for, for me, it's just general culture. Uh, a culture teaches me, whether it's um, just talking with people out there, whether it's watching news, whether it's, it's TV or, or, or movies or just what's generally accepted out there in the educational world out there, that the world teaches me sin doesn't matter. Faithfulness to God doesn't matter. Especially now, everything's okay. And how, how, how dare you say that there's something that's not okay in the world. That's what the world is teaching us. And, and, and so we're, we're dulled. 
we're dulled to success over temptation because we say, oh, if I fall to this, other people are doing this and there are no real consequences. I mentioned to you last week that we've uh, started rewatching um, the, the TV show Chuck. And, and in Chuck, you know, there's some great things in it and then there's some awful things in it in terms of relationships and, and, and marriage and that kind of thing. And it just dulls you uh, to the sense that, you know, no, no, it's not okay. It, it's not okay. You know, that, that sex is for marriage. And, and, and this is just very much dulled in all kinds of things and just and culture doesn't highlight. They don't have news reports. Movies and TV don't show us the consequences of disobedience to God's law. Now people in real life experience those consequences to disobedience to God's law. My friends, I told you about it at the, at the beginning here, they're experiencing consequences of not following God's law, but that doesn't get reported. And so we have to be careful about that, that we're not being led by the culture which says, you know, there are no real consequences, no real consequences from not following in, in, in Jesus' way. And it's okay just to give in, to give in to temp temptation. But uh, as we read in Proverbs, the evil deeds of a wicked man ensnare him. Uh, or as uh, Paul says in Galatians uh, 6, uh, God is not mocked. A man reaps what he sows. If he reaps unrighteousness, he'll, he'll, or if he sows unrighteousness, he'll, he'll reap chaos. Or, or as one of the prophets says, whirl, a whirlwind in his life. But also, number two, uh, uh, other leaders uh, will bring you failure, limited success. They'll affect your success in the gospel war for souls also. Um, we're in this war to help people come to faith in Jesus. And, and, you know, again, just general culture is teaching me every day that it doesn't matter what somebody believes. And they lessen for me when I see my non-believing friends at the gym or in my neighborhood or wherever I am or my non-believing friends from growing up or my non-believing friends on Facebook. They, 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 they lessen the, the, uh, uh, the sting of what's in front of them if they don't believe in Jesus. Um, this is as serious as things can get. And, and, but our, our, our culture is not out there saying, we don't know what's going to happen to us in eternity. Can anyone tell us? But our culture is saying, everyone's going to be fine. And that's bad leadership. That's Saul. That's limited victory for the kingdom of God. So three. So that's 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 the consequences of not following Jesus. The consequences, uh, distress, and unnecessary trouble. Then number three, the sense, the sense. Why it makes sense to reject other leaders and follow Jesus instead? Why does it make sense for you to follow Jesus in, in this in this life? Uh, one of the uh, people I was talking to recently that I told you about and that's just where it came to you know I don't know that Jesus has any relevance to us um, or whether it matters if we follow him or in his church or not and they used to be in the church and now the the family's not um, anywhere but what's the sense why does it make why does it matter for us in our lives uh, to be following Jesus um, well there's a, a, a sense in rejecting other leaders and following Jesus instead and, and a other leaders, here's why, other leaders will lead you into commitments that, apart from the guidance of Scripture, um, are foolish. Other leaders are just taking shots in the dark of what you should do and how you should think. And so they wind up in all kinds of foolish places. So Saul was just taking a shot in the dark. One of the things we see about Saul over and over is he doesn't inquire of the Lord. And we saw that here in this passage. He says, let's go and let's run these guys over now. You know, everything, you know, and the people are exhausted, all that kind of thing. And everybody says, yeah, let's go. And that priest says, probably Ahijah from earlier in the, he says, wait, shouldn't we inquire of the Lord first? And so Saul says, okay, let's do that. And, and he does. He doesn't get an answer. Uh, but but Saul, Saul doesn't inquire of the Lord, so he's just taking shots in the dark. And you can look out there, go to the bookstore. Okay, go in the nonfiction section, okay, and you will see book after book 
taking shots in the dark at how you should live your life. What's important? I to go to the show Chuck. There's a character named uh, Awesome. Yeah, that's his nickname. And he, his dad comes to stay with him for a couple of days. And he says, hey, dad, let's go do some ab work. And his dad says, yeah. You know, so, you know, what's, what does it matter that we do ab work? Does it matter to, you know, and all kinds of people are saying all kinds of things. Um, do, does, it, does it matter to do this or matter to do that? How should you, it, it, should business be your focus? Should profit margin be your focus? That's a question in business. You know, and that's a, that's a, a leadership of your soul thing. If you're running your own company, and, and Scripture speaks to that and says, no, yet you need to provide for your family, sure, but you need to provide for your employees and to pay them fairly, and you need to provide a service that will be to, their, to your customers' benefit. And if you find out your product is leading to diabetes, time to get a new product. If you find your product is leading to all kinds of diseases, Time to get a new product. You know, if you're a drug dealer, time to get in another line of work. There. Maybe profitable for your family, but it's leading to disaster. Uh, but all kinds of things out there about what's important. Um, is it important to you? Know, and if you go, go to GNC, okay, you'll be overwhelmed with what's important. You know, you can, you can take... Uh, 175 different vitamins and minerals, and they all do something for you. And they're all claiming you can read all kinds of articles. Take, you know, this magnesium, or you need this potassium, or you need gluco whatever, you know, and now all these kind of things. And you can, you can spend your life, you can spend, you know, two hours in the morning taking all your vitamins. Right? Okay? And all, all this clamor for what's important in your life. Others will lead you into commitments that are, that are foolish. Uh, uh, Proverbs 9, 13 through 18, Bob read for us. Folly is uh, personified. Folly calls out in the streets at the top of the city where, where everyone can hear her and says, follow me. Everybody, come on into my house. And that's what the world does. It says, come on into my house. Do what I'm doing. Okay? No salt in your diet. Whoops, well, salt's not so bad. No eggs in your diet. Well, actually, eggs have no relationship to cholesterol in your bloodstream. Oh, uh, you, you know, and those of you who have lived a long time, you know. You know. Oh, no fat. Actually, there are some fats that are good. You know, and we're just, you know, this is stuff in my adult lifetime that were, you know, anathema, and, you know, terrible things to do, and now where people are saying, oh, no, actually, that's good. Skim milk, whole milk. Okay? Everything you know, changes. The, the world is clamoring for us. But do, do we follow the world? Or is that just folly? And, and what God tells us there in Proverbs is that the world's full of folly. And, and that folly's house is full of people in their graves. It hasn't led to, it hasn't led to their good. It hasn't led to their, their prosperity uh, in life. Um, so Jesus, on the other hand, uh, Jesus, on the other hand, um, will lead you uh, to have a life that's lived wisely. Okay? Jesus leads you in a, a life that's, that's wise. And actually, Proverbs really, when it talks about wisdom, is really talking about God's word. It's primarily 90% of wisdom is you look at the book of Proverbs, you look at the book of Ecclesiastes, when it says wisdom, it's talking about following God's commands. 10% of wisdom is knowing how to apply God's commands in certain situations. But 90% of it is just God's commands. Wisdom, wisdom is following God's commands. Wisdom is not committing adultery. Oh, well, it's a command. Commandment number seven of the Ten Commandments. And, and so, but, but this is God, God is known by his wisdom, and God calls out. And he offers us his wisdom and his word. And this is how Jesus is portrayed in the book of James. Okay? Jesus himself is wisdom calling out. Or how Jesus is portrayed by Matthew in Matthew 5 through 7 in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus' wisdom calling out from the highest place, come to me, take in my wisdom as to how to live life. So Jesus teaches us to live life wisely. And then B, B, others will not lead you by looking for the Lord's will first. And this is, the, this is what Saul shows us again. 
He doesn't look for the Lord's will first. Over and over again, he just plunges into things. Um, he, he has a, a, a where did he get that? Where did he get that vow? Nobody eat anything before going into battle. <laughs> it's it's not commanded in Scripture. He just he just it's a shot in the dark, you know, shot in the dark. And, and, and that's what the world is like. Just shots in the dark of what's good for you and what's bad for you. You know, those of you who have been around a long time, open marriage, okay? Early 70s, shot in the dark. Well, sometimes in marriage it's difficult. Maybe we should have open marriages where both partners agree we can date other people and it's okay with both of us. Yeah, my wife's going like that. That's one of the reasons I married Betsy because she always says, oh, it's so gross. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, but, but yeah, shot in the dark. And then, well, you know, that didn't work out so well. No one was talking about open marriage by the late 70s. Um, you know, and, and that's Saul. Other kings but Jesus, they're just guessing. Just guessing at what might be good for you. And time will, time will come about, you know, and, and then people will have walked in these foolish ways and experienced the consequences of it, and then we'll know. Okay, that's a dumb idea open marriage. That's a dumb Okay. Not eating before going to battle. Dumb idea. <laughs> dumb idea. And not eating while you're in battle. Dumb idea. You know when you're doing a marathon, this is why I quit my marathon training, you cannot survive a marathon unless you're taking in calories. Even the, the, the uh, w people who win Boston Marathon and New York Marathon, anybody, you hit at 19 miles, somewhere in 18, 19 miles, your body shuts down unless you've been taking in calories and nutrition so they're eating and that's they have these glue goo packages that are high ca calorie things and all that kind of thing uh, uh, there and i said that's unnatural i'm not training for a marathon anymore if you have to eat before you finish you shouldn't be doing it um the guy who ran the original marathon you know what happened to him when he finished he died yeah he gave the message and he keeled over and died um, <laughs> but uh, uh, shots, shots in the dark there. But Jesus teaches how to live uh, wisely, and he, he teaches us to look to the Lord's will first. Um, and this is one thing we'll see in contrast to Saul, just having this foolish vow out of nowhere, just plucked from the sky. We'll see David over and over, before he goes to battle, inquires of the Lord. And he asks this question that Saul gets to, and good for Saul for getting to it. But, but he asks this question, Lord, should we attack them or not? What should we do? And he waits there. And we see this with other faithful sons of David, who are David's descendants later in Israel's history. They say, what should we do? And they pray to the Lord before they do anything. And then the Lord gives them answer. And so Jesus leads us in the Lord's, in the Lord's will first. Think about this. If others are leading your soul in some way, they're not motivated. They don't even know what the Lord's will is. And so they're not going to guide you in what the Lord's will is first. They're just a version of Saul, not looking to, to Scripture. And, and we recognize Scripture as God's guideline for us, as how we're framed to live, uh, and, and that there's blessing that comes along with that. But here's something else. Besides this, uh, other leaders not leading us to the Lord's will first, which will bring blessing upon us and wisdom to us uh, as well. See there in your outline, us will lead you not for the Lord's honor, not for the Lord's honor and your good, but based on their self-interest. Others will lead you, others besides Jesus will lead you to their self-interest. Notice, you know, what a contrast here. We'll see when we get to chapter 17, why does David get so overwhelmed and, and just beyond himself and why does he put himself out there in front of Goliath? Because he's standing there having delivered the, the, the bread and the cheese to his brothers, and he hears Goliath's threat. And Goliath not only taunts Israel, but he taunts Israel's God. And that's the, that's the punchline to David when he talks to the, the people beside him. And when he goes before Saul and says, Saul, let me fight this, this, this Philistine, this uncircumcised Philistine, which is what Jonathan had called uh, these guys. Let me fight them because he has brought dishonor. He's disdaining the Lord. And when, when Goliath says, 
Who are you? Come to me. Am I a dog that you come to me with, with a stick? David, David says, I, I, you know, not a sword. David says, I don't need a sword. I don't need, I don't need armor. I come to you in the name of the Lord our God. And the birds will eat your flesh today. Okay? David's concern is that the Lord's name has been dishonored. And the Lord, who is God of Israel, was being embarrassed by this champion Philistine. And so David goes out for the Lord's honor there, not for his self-interest. His self-interest is taking care of sheep away from the battle. He's not self-interested. He's willing to die for his people if he needs to die for his people. But he's out there for the Lord's honor. And, and that's, you know, Jim Jones, self-interest. He needed people to follow him. He needed to control people. And one of the people, one of the reasons that one of the things that brought and the chief thing that brought him to bring the people to this mass suicide was things were getting out of control. There were 15 people who had left with the journalists and, and this congressman. And, and he saw they were going to go back to the United States and report this. And so he sent out guards and they shot all those people as they were getting on onto the plane, the congressman and these other uh, media folks. A couple snuck, snuck off into the weeds and with their bullet wounds and, and ended up surviving. But then he calls everybody else to kill themselves because he saw he was losing control of them. It was Jim Jones' self-interest that was leading them to do thus and so. And a lot of times when there are people trying to lead our souls, there's self-interest involved. I've done this. And so if other people live in this way too, that'll justify the way I've lived. And so we have to recognize this. But Jesus, in contrast, doesn't come to this earth to lead us out of his self-interest. He doesn't come, as we, we read in our Declaration of the Gospel, to serve, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus doesn't lead us out of self-interest. He leads us out of interest in us, to bless us. And to, and to guide us. Uh, as we see here, to fill out your blank in the outline there, David would be the opposite of Saul, and so would Jesus be. David would put himself out there uh, for the interest of God's people, not his own. And Jesus would do the same. Jesus came to the earth uh, for your good. Um, what he got on the earth was humiliation. What he got on the earth was, was mocking. It was not to his self-interest to put himself there before the Pharisees and Herod and, and Pilate to come to this earth and, and suffer the infirmities of this life, but he comes for our sake. Uh, these folks I was telling you about at the, at the beginning um, here, um, the good news is that one of these friends of mine who has been in the church um, from the early 90s and then hit this period where he said, I don't think following him, Jesus' ways is of any value for me, and who experienced a, a divorce and his family disintegrating and great pain and bouts of depression and, and a whole groups of people who won't talk to him uh, any, anymore. Um, he's, he's come to repentance. And, and after a, a great period of chaos in his life is, is reintegrating uh, with the church and sensing his own need for, for fellowship and being, taking in God's word. And, 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 that's, and that's great news. He's learned through the hard life experience that there's value in following Jesus in this life. Now, my other friend uh, hasn't come to this place yet. And he's still thinking that he and his family are going to be okay out there. And my prayer for him is that they won't have to go through uh, family disintegration and tremendous hardship and, and, and depression and chaos personally in order to turn back to the Lord, uh, but that rather they would see the wisdom of following Jesus before they got to, before they got to that place. So that's the message for us. That Jesus not only has value for you and I in terms of our eternity, but his ways have value for us so that we're not walking in foolish ways like the people under Saul. So that our victory is not just limited. So that we're not just hobbling in to the end of our lives and, and 
uh, faithfulness and unfaithfulness, but rather that God's able to bless us uh, to the degree that he'd really love to bless us as we follow a David, Jesus himself, instead of, instead of others. So to, to summarize all this for you, your conclusion there, letting others lead your soul will lead to personal distress. That's the, that's the meaning of this passage for us. Letting others, letting a king that God has not chosen for you, uh, letting him lead you will lead to personal distress. Uh, so vitality for, vitality, for victory, uh, for blessing in life, uh, you need to follow Jesus. Uh, learn this the easy way, by faith, and just following, rather than through the hard way, uh, like this friend of mine. Let's pray.